1, 2. Pues cuando me digas eh, comienzo. Ahora ya, ahora sí. Buenas tardes a todas y a todas. Bienvenidas, bienvenidos a la, lo que será la última mesa de este segundo seminario Descolonizando Territorios Urbanos, que como saben, esta segunda edición presencial por fin del año. Good afternoon, everyone. This last round table is dedicated to violence. de ver eh, anteayer. ¿no? Después de esta mesa, que acabará en torno a las 16.30, haremos como siempre una pausa café y después eh, ya cerraremos el seminario con la, el visionado de los dos últimos documentales para acabar ya esta segunda edición del seminario. Bien, pues vamos a comenzar esta mesa. Veo bastante gente con ganas de intervenir. Um, we'll set up uh, an in-person table. We will listen 
to uh, Alaire Vences, then Edith Gamboa and Rodrigo Aguirre in persona. Um, this will be uh, um, regarding a violence uh, with a rural context and also urban. Of course, the topic of violence have appeared uh, within the rest of the tables. Uh, the table yesterday was about imaginaries, where we also address uh, this imaginaries and the violence and how to eradicate it. And so today, I think the discussion group today will uh, end very good this topic when we speak about uh, colonizing views. Uh, so we will begin with Alay de Vences. I remind you all uh, to the speakers that you have 15 minutes and I will tell you when uh, you still have two minutes left. the presentation i uh maybe you can help me to show it so firstly thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, exchange space for allowing me to nurture and uh, being here in this discussion and so um i will i will see my notes so so i i don't know exceed my time i'll be reading at some parts of my presentation Well, so with this presentation, I wanted to share some reflections regarding the um, urbanistic logic in Cojutla, Morelos, where I was born and um, where I also inhabited in Al till I um, was an adult and where I come back usually to nurture my, of course, my familiar relationships and with my friends that are still there. The process um, of deterritorialization that happened in Jujutla was similar to the one that we saw in Tome, Chile. Maybe we will see some similarities along the presentation. In this reflection that I'm sharing here, I try to focus on the elements that um, result in the loss of identity that had helped to um, disorganize um, urban ordering and the disappearing of um, traditional knowledge. We will do it this. We will do this through agrarian distribution, racism, and modernity. This is an investigation that um, comes from my experience uh, uh, within my PhD investigation. This was not my my topic. It was a collaborative um, research with the Indigenous Women Coordinator. That is an organization that's been um, working in activism for 25 years. And the investigation was uh, collaborated not because I won it, uh, but because uh, the, the organization made me um, do this, this effort if I wanted to do their project. And one of the elements uh, that I was asked for was that uh, I myself went uh, under revision let's say. So I'm always uh, going back to the feminist approach. And I also had to ask myself from the place where I was relating with them. The result was very rich because I could understand how through um, their stories, I could understand some stories that uh, affected me and my uh, community story. Some stories, uh, of course, that they shared uh, were very touching, for example, uh, migration. They were speaking personally uh, about this uh, migration, the loss of their native language, because uh, some communities in Mexico, of course, have lost their language as they migrated. And there were other aspects as well that we uh, shared that was this uh, generational trauma as a result of the uh, racist uh, policies of uh, mixture between the Mexican uh, people, population, let's say. 
So um, uh, what initiated as a reflexive process uh, started as a self-ethnographic uh, research, very needed to understand what was happening within my community. Because um, during uh, this investigation, there was an earthquake that maybe you knew about in Mexico in 2017, uh, two big earthquakes, the, the second one of them, uh, the uh, 17th uh, September of 2017. And the second one was very destructive for my community and for Mexico, of course. And before moving on, I would like to say that this uh, self-ethnographic uh, um, investigation was also um, complemented by some narratives, uh, by, by some uh, neighbors from the, from the municipality, some institutions, and of course it was supported by a historical register that my dad did. He's inserted into the uh, historical culture of the country and from uh, for some years he has been uh, working as a historian for the community so he recovered some some files through interviews to to family members uh, to people uh, from from the village so these documents were, were lended by him and I did this analysis uh, through these files. I never moved the slides, I'm sorry. So here, uh, I would like first to locate Jujutla. You can see a circle uh, inside Mexico. This is the country. The country, of course, as you know, um, is formed by states. Uh, one uh, state is Morelos, one of the smaller ones. And as you can see, it's um, located uh, in a location, sorry that allows the the trade of uh, people and products as well to the north, the south, the west, and east is very centric. So this has uh, allowed uh, dynamics that affect the peri-urban model that has uh, has been the, 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 the form that the village has acquired. So, um, pre hispanically speaking, their name was Susudla in the native language and was colonized in, in the 18th century and stayed this way to the 19th century with migrants from other regions who were uh, granted land titles and were authorized to settle in different neighborhoods as they were searching and looking forward to better uh, life conditions, as this was a very commercial point that was communicating Cuernavaca with Acapulco that were two very important cities, touristically speaking. And with this different migratory flows, flows sorry, um, the city received uh, Spaniard families and also indigenous uh, peoples from other areas that were forced to work as uh, farmers, um, within uh, the livestock industry and also the sugarcane industry. These pictures were taken um, right um, after the, the earthquake. And to understand what happened here, I used three concepts that I already addressed. And I would like to explain them. First, agrarian distribution. Uh, I mean, land distribution that is uh, carried about by the post-revolutionary states from 1811 to 1992 that uh, implied the privatization of the lands uh, given by the people and that followed the Mexican revolution that uh, began being the, the main uh, state policies to um, ameliorate the uh, inequalities that uh, were going around 
the, the land regarding indigenous peoples. When I speak uh, about racism, it's of course the superiority of a race uh, over the other and that they should be kept separated. Of course, this is a, this is a cultural and ideological creation that is in constant movement that transforms. And by modernity, I imply what Ruizena signals as this uh, connotation of thriving and has to do with the um, ethnic killing policies in name of uh, the mixture of the population. Buena parte de los habitantes originarios de la colonia, este es el plano de this is the map of my colonia, the neighborhood where I live, and the most part of the people who got there were farmers. This area was just for housing, and this was declared in 1925. Most of these families were indigenous, and many of them participated from next to Zapata. This is related to the genealogical history. My grandparents had an important role in the revolution fighting next to Zapata. In fact, this colonia is called Emiliano Zapata because they fought next to him. And this was the restitution to the claim. So they got this land and some very interesting phenomena happened here. Many of the indigenous practices are still here. When yesterday we heard about what happened in a different area, it made me remember what happened here in Cucutla. There's a loss of the language. Today, nobody identifies themselves as indigenous, even though they come from these warrior indigenous peoples. My granny was a healer and when I asked my family about these histories, they were not willing to know about this knowledge because there is a lot of internal racism. So regarding this healer role, the aunts and the grannies felt bad about it. They felt shame because her mother or her sister was a healer. So we have this internal racism that is part of this repetition of land. The, the proposal of the revolution is to stop inequity and to build peace. And the repartition of land is part of this. But what happens? What happens is that this distribution is doing in parallel with Ejirales land. So I was talking about housing, but they also get land to exploit, to produce food. So they have some livelihoods, some income. And what happens here? So they get these lands. Oscar was telling us how this agrarian board is made, and we have two ways. We have these ejidales areas and communities. This ejidal, which are agricultural communities didn't have land before. So these are people that get 
the land as a retribution because they didn't have good living or social conditions. And then we have the community land, which is the recognition to territories that were already inhabited by indigenous people. So it's a recognition because they always lived there. And here we have two types of exercise of agrarian property. And here we have this ejido, which is kind of a collective, not a community. The main source of production is going to be the sugar cane. So these workers who come to work to the land, they produce sugar cane and rice mainly. This results in something that is part of this model that the colleague Felipe was talking before, this model of the work, good life part of it with the agricultural production in these lands that were given to them. And this activity gave them some economical success for a while, but not completely because there were some security issues, violence, precarious situations, also kidnappings that affect the place. This is the area of Cucucla. The green part is mainly sugar, cane, and rice. So imagine living for years with all of this sugar cane production that burns and all the alcohol that is being produced, the different diseases. There are some registers of pulmonary diseases that are produced due to these conditions. And then the tremor, the earthquake, brought all of the things that were already struggling. So, Nobody thought like, why did these houses fall? They said, oh no, but because these houses were poor people's houses, but why, why? These were mainly indigenous people's houses, indigenous who came here looking for better opportunities, looking for better conditions of life. I'm running out of time and I won't be able to talk more about the procedures, but I would like to close with this, with the actions that we delivered with the neighbors. We asked for support from institutional, academic institutions, from engineers, undergraduate students, and they help us to recognize all the things that failed in the earthquake that made the houses to fail. So there was an architect that is called Alejandra Caballero. She is, she has supported a lot the eco-construction and we made these walks with her and the neighbors and she told her, told us that many of these failures, she was, we were looking at a place similar to this one. We had adobe, and you know that adobe and other materials do not work similarly. What we see here is a historical fact that shows the losing of traditional practices. They use these materials in an improper way. So this is the appropriation of a historical way of building 
that was alienated to this idea of modernity, saying that other materials were the best that could that we could get. Here we have pictures of the same place a century ago, 1920. And this is how it looks like now. As you can see, it changed completely. Many of these constructions were, uh, well, they fell in the earthquake. And now we are facing this challenge, how to recover this identity when the architecture that was key, that was crucial to our community is no longer there. I'll leave it here. Thank you very much. Bien, gracias, Elaide. Seguimos, Thank eh... you, Elaide. So we will continue with um, the presentation of Edith Gamboa called Urban Violence and Political Ecology. Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias, Carlos. Y... Good afternoon. Thank you, Carlos. And uh, good afternoon to the ones that are connected and the ones that are in here. My name is Edith Gamboa. I was born in Buenaventura Valle in Colombia, uh, West Colombia, with uh, the Pacific. That's uh, something that we have in, in common. Uh, that's, that was my childhood. After uh, that, I moved to Cali, and then I moved to Santander um, in the uh, center east of uh, Colombia. And I studied in the Industrial University of Santander. near the Magdalena River. So my intervention will be divided into three parts. A brief introduction, I speak uh, about the urban violences from an environmental uh, political viewpoint. After that, the violences within the Amazonia within the Amazonas. Um, for the first part, I will base my work uh, in a brief aspect of my PhD thesis. For the second part in a workshop that I uh, developed with an Argentinian professor called Merlinsky, Gabriela Merlinsky. And then for the third part, I will base on a ruling of the Supreme Court of uh, protection. Uh, where, uh, because it, it is called differently uh, from country to country that um, has to do with the Amazonas territory from a uh, Colombian perspective, uh, considering that it's not a, a, a Colombian territory itself, but of course, ecosystem has no boundaries. So we will go to the first part as an introduction. My PhD thesis um, that is uh, coming to an end right now in political philosophy is called uh, political constitutionalism and the, the recognition of, of non-human beings, philosophical fundaments for a, a constitutional proposal in Colombia. I want to use this concept because the constitutional court um, from the protection uh, court rule called the Cuenca de Rio Atrato, the rule declared this whole system of the Atrato River, considering a biocultural perspective, declare him a subject of uh, rights. So this is the inspiration for this PhD investigation based on philosophy and, of course, uh, legal aspects, because we had to analyze this first ruling, um, this milestone ruling that uh, established uh, a law line. So in political uh, ecology, we see some situated perspectives. We see alliances of knowledge production, different stakeholders that are producing uh, knowledge, popular uh, epistemology, mapping uh, as official and unofficial 
um, regarding the indigenous peoples, um, neighbors from the community that go to universities so they can uh, work and diagnose uh, together with the academia to establish some uh, common goals to, for example, measure the water quality when um, there are diseases that rise within the city are supposed to be um, uh, effect of some territorial processes. Uh, they are told that uh, they are the they are responsible for these diseases because they do not have hygienic conditions, but they are effect of certain types of industries and pollution. The, these effects that are uh, these what are what are affecting people, uh, the neighbors from the community. We can find several stakeholders, as I said, and and somehow this has to do with um, the way uh, waste management is being taken place within the community. What we call a uh, final disposition when it comes to waste management. Also, we're speaking about uh, toxic waste and how they are located within the certain uh, communities and not in, in others. This is no uh, casualty because um, certain types of communities and groups and people are receiving um, these topics of uh, racial uh, ambientalism or some other uh, particularities. So the visibilization of bodies of alternative knowledge vis-a-vis uh, -vis the conception that only uh, include a scientific paradig paradigm uh, from the Western uh, traditions, plural, including the, the law and law sciences. As uh, Fabian and other colleagues uh, were speaking about how law le legitimates some forms and delegitimates some other forms. Uh, so uh, evidence is uh, enough to prove something or not. So ecology in Latin America is um, operating under under the the fundament whether there was colonialism or not. So uh, many many countries of the Caribbean and of course Latin America we've been colonized, but colonization it's it's more uh, now. It of course addresses uh, science, uh, history, geography. And of course, we have had this coloniality of nature as, as something uh, dominated by science as a object of dispute, of appropriation, of re-meaning. Uh, but now we are changing it, taking into account uh, some uh, fundamentals that are philosophical, that come from uh, Andean epistemologies, native epistemologies in Latin America and the Caribbean, among others. Many of them uh, come from the uh, native communities. So for example, uh, when it, it, it comes to taking care of, of a hill, when we saw yesterday uh, on our field trip, more than considering it as an idealized subject, it, it is recognized um, as a, 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 with a individual aspects that is very hard to understand by the Western conception and also by the urban conception. It's very hard to understand how um, certain objects such as hills, nature can be given, let's say, human characteristics, uh, as I was saying from the river in Colombia, because um, this sentence uh, gave rights to other objects. Uh, in here we have as well uh, debates over uh, environment in the global south that are emerging, but we still see some invisibilization of the works that come from the global south. So we need policies and we need several categories, different ways based on the uh, intersectionality 
that that was um, spoken about yesterday not only speaking uh, about uh, gender and economy but as well as uh, species or capacities to recognize um, those beings uh, animals let's say that have a different capacity so we need to check at the political implications and to address as well address as well the different uh, movements uh, that claim social uh, social environmental justice just a way to to link these uh, social and environmental natures where we have been educated so in uh, environmental policies we need to consider uh, inequalities environmental inequalities uh, politic uh, ecology studies as well uh, some aspects that are permanent that we have seen through the several video documentaries and uh, uh, through an example that, that we will see here soon uh, regarding the stakeholders and the disputes so uh, regarding this the communities do not have um, um, previous consultation which is the, the right uh, to be uh, consulted and to take decisions when it comes to an industrial project so they are consulted um, because they are the people that are of course inhabiting there and to ask them if they they approve the, the project and this uh in colombia has been uh has have been a lot of uh consultations and they have been considered by the supreme court as a fundamental right where this is not guaranteed but it's uh, a minimum that is established to be done a right and there are cases where there has been very difficult to prove this. Nicole was speaking about the people Afro-descendants. And of course, for the Afro-descendants, it's even more difficult because of this territoriality. Uh, you need uh, to prove through uh, many ways. Sometimes it has been approved, sometimes not. And it's still a very critical issue, a very difficult issue that differentiates the different uh, indigenous peoples. So we will see at some aspects within um, environmental politics. Sin perjuicio de lo disciplinar que cada persona aquí tiene, sin perjuicio de la ciencia, disciplina, área en la cual cada persona se mueva, eh, lo que se está, quiere decir aquí es que... What we, may, what we mean here is that for communities on site, speaking about parts for million, speaking about technical concepts in biology or other fields of knowledge, we must translate this into the language of the people because there is inequality in the knowledge. There is a dispossession not only of territories, of land, also of knowledge. We must acknowledge that it's not that the technical scientific knowledge is the only one that is valid. It is not like that. So it is key to listen to the communities. For the communities, it is their way of living, something very daily life, of daily life. And from the academia, they want statistics, concepts, but these are very abstract. And this discussion of the daily life is not tangible. The second aspect comes from Martinez Allier, an author, and he talks about values, how values are not measurable. 
So we have different types of values and thinking in the industry and, and all of the companies were thinking of numbers. How much is it worth to live? How much for health? We are just uh, going through a pandemic. So we have different values that must be in the core of the discussion. All of this knowledge are important to life. Let's go to the third aspect. The expert discourse is not the one that it's not the best, let's say. Let's say that the last word is not in the universities. Uh, many times, university is what we want to prevail, but the expert discourse is not the best. We have a dialogue of different knowledges in the language of life. We have different tensions as well. Fourth point recognition and discrimination. The bigger environmental impact, who is suffering it? What people, what groups of people, what communities? The bigger impact of the social, environmental and natural issues. Are there aspects in common? We must see that. <laughs> we find local communities, ancestral communities, women, farmers, and some sectors in the urban, people who recycle, the people who work with waste, or what the urban area called waste, these people are also included here. There is this contradiction that we don't want waste in our own territory. But if it goes to a different territory, then it doesn't affect me, it's not my problem. But it shouldn't be next to anyone or on anyone's backyard. So we must look at different ways. We must have alternative proposals of this final waste. Fifth, we have symbolic violence, uh, symbolic violence and discrimination. We have to incorporate in our analysis to make it as complete as possible. Not just look it through just a legal point of view or just biological point of view or just environmental point of view, we must include different aspects. And the last point, the need and the demand of state policies. Where there is a problem, the state must have had some vigilance and monitoring, what we call in Colombia, and not omission. In many places, it is proved that there was an omission from the public and the state part. So the problems get bigger in this meantime. So we have the conflict of mining and gold, the pollution for mercury. Finally, we have also the threat and then there are many times we talk about the species of animals, unique species, species, and also a community of people who can talk about these dangers. And the last part is about the Amazon. We have the violence that is through reforestation. La sentencia STC, STC. We have sentence STC 4360 from 2018 from the Supreme Court. 
this, you know, it's the rural and the urban, the ancestral and the different groups in the cities. It brings together the youth and the elders. The ones that were born and the ones that didn't born. So we are talking about the Amazon as a territory that is huge, but also a local territory that many communities live there. And this sentence has is accounting for people who are not located in this territory in a specific. So it's a very interesting sentence and it has an outreach that is much bigger than the one that we can see, could consider from uh, indigenous native communities. Thank you very much. Gracias, Edith. Eh, vamos con la última ponencia de la tarde y del día y del seminario, que es la de Rodrigo Aguirre. Let's go now with the last talk of the day and of the Congress. He's going to talk about the fetishing of property and space, a documentary film proposal for its unveiling. You have 15 minutes, please. Bueno, que nada, eh, primero que nada, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, darles gracias por... Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank you for the opportunity of speaking in this seminar. It's been uh, very interesting all along. Uh, I hope mine was interesting, uh, even though it, it doesn't have a lot to do with the topics that we have been addressing. But I would like to uh, address as well the concept of private property. Um, from a visual um, approach to, to ask uh, uh, something um, that is how property can become a political dispute. Um, so my presentation is called The Fetishism uh, of Property in Space, a documentary film proposal for its unveiling. I start with a quote they don't know it, but they do it, which um, references how uh, commodities uh, are, are being uh, traded within the, the human context. And we don't know it, but they determine our, our relationships in the world. The, complex, the complexity that uh, Marx proposes and, uh, by analyzing products and commodities uh, is that while they may seem uh, just things that are um, more complex uh, every time, they are uh, full of uh, subtle context, uh, concepts, sorry, and their characterization does not uh, come from its uh, value. So where does the, does the value uh, come? Where does the, the value of the community? So, um, commodities show a relation uh, between the product and the human. So, um, we try to explain how a simple object uh, through work is uh, becomes uh, a commodity. So in nature, uh, something does not, uh, something is of course outside the eye, but we can see the object and we understand it as a sphere. So the question is how this simple expression, uh, simple of nature within um, goods, and commerce uh, end up meaning something else. So we understand that commodities uh, uh, and their value does not depend only on the work. 
but the social relation established by men establishes um, the, the shape uh, and the relationship uh, between objects. So Marx explained that uh, commodities and their value does not come from their uh, material characteristics, but something that uh, the human being gives them. So if we think If we think about uh, Marx's uh, metaphor of the concept of uh, commodity um, to realize uh, the fetishism of uh, commodities, we need to take into account the, the time we work uh, commodities. If we think about this metaphor, we can ask ourselves what is the, the best way or the uh, needed mechanism to um, distinguish uh, the importance of private property within space. So regarding fetishism of property in space, we can uh, see, of course, money as the, as the end of, of the whole uh, capital chain. The, the, these forms uh, socially validated by the production means uh, characterize this system and this uh, commodity production. Regarding property, what are the questions uh, that I asked? So what is the best way to um, unveil property within the, this space as a material concept? Is it, is it possible to think property as a metaphor or uh, as a concealed city? Is it possible to conceive uh, property as an image or and are we able to unveil this image? If we come back to the metaphors of Marx, uh, we, we can find some explanations into religious concepts where beings have uh, their own life and even commodities uh, have a, a soul even. But however, we are displacing to another form of production. What Marx is saying is that these community commodities, when you study them, you can find the origin. And you can as well uh, ask the same question um, with property, what it's, its origin and how it develops um, through space. So I think um, the meaning of property uh, does not have to do with uh, its technical meaning. It authorizes uh, the right to dwell in space. It also talks about the distribution of resources. But what I think uh, it's complexity, it's in the mechanism that conceals uh, property, that it's law and violence. So the author here, uh, Lisa Sanchez says that recognizing violence needs a space and, and the right gives uh, law its space and law gives uh, violence. Law creates effectively a place for violence, a space where violence uh, does not have a witness. Berman uh, as well, and theories from Israeli, from Israel, it speaks about uh, technologies of power. La develación de la propiedad, al igual que el fetichismo de la, de la mercancía, pasa por visualizar los poderes ideológicos especializados, ¿cierto? Y las disposiciones estéticas de la propiedad en el espacio. Commodities uh, 
fetishism also has to do with the unveiling of uh, aesthetic aspects of the space and commodity. This aesthetic discussion of the property, I mentioned that there is a traction of the space. Within the theory of art, there is a theorist that says that without structure, there is no art. First of all, we have the intellectual discovery, and then the artistic discovery that is an expression. Then Lucas states how artists can try the issues of a social reality that's hidden the laws of the artistic beauty. And then we get to the tool through which we can unveil this. We are not aiming to debate things, but just question and introduce a modification of social order and create a critique of this establishment. So I'm bringing I'm bringing here two proposals of documentaries. Both are made by Marta Rodriguez and Jorge Silva, two authors that are very famous in the Colombian documentary scene. These two documentaries, Tircales and Campesinos, are about the property issue, specifically in the fields and in indigenous peoples. I would like us to check to extract, to talk about the setting of this. So here we have a uh, voice enough talking about the issue of property in Colombia and different fragments from urban spaces in peripheries. The second tract fragment that we will see is from campesinos. Si para el indígena la tierra es la raíz de su cultura, para la clase dominante la posesión de la tierra confiere poder. El 4% de los propietarios detenta el 67% de la tierra, mientras el 73% está hacinado en el 7% de la tierra condenado al minifundio, sometido a la descomposición neocolonial del campesinado. La práctica que demuestra esto, compañeros, que la 
burguesía y los terratenientes no resuelven ni pueden resolver el problema del pueblo, que es a los campesinos, a los obreros y a los demás sectores que nos corresponde dar esa lucha para resolver ese problema profundo y grave de las masas trabajadoras. A cambio que ustedes sí saben lo que es el problema agrario, ¿cierto? Apuesto que ustedes sí saben que la viuda barrio los quiere reprimir violentamente metiéndolos a la cárcel. Apuesto que ustedes saben que ustedes tienen insegura la cosecha este año que viene. Esa es la inseguridad social en el campo. Porque si nosotros no tenemos un pedazo de tierra, ¿dónde vamos a parar las viviendas, compañero? Porque, compañero, si realmente nosotros necesitamos la tierra, debemos enfrentarnos a lo que se nos venga. Porque vemos, compañero, de que el sistema en que nosotros vivimos no nos va a parar, compañero. No nos van a entregar la tierra porque los terratenientes sean buenos. No nos van a entregar nada porque ellos son buenos, compañero. No tenemos nosotros que lucharlo. Tenemos que conseguir la tierra por medio de la lucha, compañero. ¿Por qué y en qué forma el campesino y el indio pasan a través de la práctica social, de la sumisión a la organización? Responder a esta pregunta hace necesario recuperar su verdadera memoria. En ambos casos eh, se van configurando ciertas estructuras de montaje. Primero que nada tiene que ver con el uso de, del archivo, ¿cierto? Que se contrapone con la realidad. Y en segundo caso, el... So in this way, we set different approaches, direct cinema and storytelling. Walter Benjamin speaks about a concept that is his assembly. So he says that we need fragments from reality to take the function away and create some sense in a new assembly, creating a new story. In the case that we just saw, that's exactly what happens. They take a specific discourse, the discourse of the president, and they add images that somehow are not related to that concept of property that he's talking about. So thinking of this question or the idea that is first established the study of the property in the social struggle, I think that through assembly and this audiovisual registers, we can have an artistic point of view and a study to understand these land uses. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Bien, gracias, Rodrigo. Eh, vamos a iniciar, si les parece. Thank la... you, Rodrigo. So, um, we will initiate the discussion group. Con, eh, Thank you very much, Rodrigo. We're going to start the discussion with the three speakers. Adiv, Rodrigo, and Alaide. Please sit here, and we're going to just talk now. Bien, gracias. Eh, pues como okay. los días anteriores. So, thank you. Uh, as uh, previous days, we we had a very interesting 
presentations, uh, a lot of material, a lot of terminology, a lot of practice as well that we can discuss. So I think uh, hopefully this is something we can we can discuss as a group um, till uh, four thirty. I will invite the public before me uh, if you if you want to say something. Um, if if you, so so you can ask or or make commentaries on whatever whatever you want to say so as to open this discussion lines even though they're different from from the ones um that i establish of course so while uh, this happens i i wanted to say i, I have here many uh notes i wanted to begin uh, by alaide um her at the beginning of her presentation that she had uh, to do a self ethnographic and a forced investigation that was not her intention she was not considering that at the beginning of her investigation and then you spoke about the familiar uh, file that came out as, uh, as well with the uh, uh, rodrigo's presentation so i wanted to know how was uh, your investigation this self uh, 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 the self investigation and how it was related with this uh, family type what was the role of this uh, within your investigation so when you speak about the role uh, do you mean how uh, the rest of the people were involved in my investigation I, I want to know how they affected uh, these two figures uh, to your investigation. Okay, so uh, with my relation with uh, Konami, as I was uh, telling him, was was uh, going through uh, with this uh, community familiar uh, personal projection, I just wanted to um, establish a more transparent uh, link. As I was um, submitting myself, to an investigation to show them that I that I was um, I, I was not really ready uh, to give more than to listen. So it was the the other way around. I was able to know uh, some other processes as well. Uh, I learned a lot from the process that we saw yesterday and the day before. And we speak about the reciprocity of this exchange of experiences and at the end uh, the investigation is a learning process where theory comes and uh, comes and goes and you find a consensus but the, the consensus is not there if there's not reciprocity within the investigator and the subjects of the investigation so uh, this is what implied my uh, self-investigation uh, I'd say Regarding my dad, he was uh, for a long time um, researching the, the the history of the village, and so when I started my investigation, well, uh, it is worth saying, saying that I'm a mother of two. I asked my dad uh, to come with me so he could take care of of my daughters, and these reflections uh, that. Um, emerged from the from the investigation with the women in Konami, uh, specifically regarding the loss of language. I remember my grandmother that was very racist, even though when she was racist, uh, when she was indigenous, sorry, she was very racist. Um, she was uh, she was very Catholic and uh, she had this uh, huge racist vision she was uh, always uh, telling us uh, to marry uh, a white that we had uh, to improve the race. Uh, we had to look for, for uh, we had to take a, a look at their feet to see if they didn't have um, more than five fingers. So it was, it was really difficult to, to um, get to know a language because she decided not to teach the language to their, their daughters. And this is because the, the time when my neighbor was constructed was um, was a time when racism was uh, brutally established. And I was uh, speaking yesterday about how the colonial state 
uh, was evolving. And after the settle, the, the sledders left, uh, we have uh, an internal colonization system uh, and process by the state through the education uh, that, that killed the indigenous languages. So this was very important in our family process and helped that the uh, focus of my dad was uh, more linked uh, to, to investigating identity that is uh, very present within our neighbors uh, and uh, to, to those who were uh, very close um, from the process. We established a, a neighbor flood, let's say, to uh, give a different meaning to the reconstruction after the earthquake. And we were not thinking uh, about, oh, uh, poor us. Uh, we, we were reflecting on other things, deeper reflections of what uh, the past had been. And something really important that we didn't we didn't see. And uh, when when I when I first got to the um, uh, Konami, the indigenous uh, women national coordinator, uh, I found out, of course, uh, the, these conditions of privilege. And um, also I reflected on how being a uh, mix, it's not uh, necessarily uh, a point of privilege because uh, there's gender as well, there's age. And, and this past that I, that I was mentioning that was forgotten in, in Mexico, uh, where the big part of, of uh, the population are not only part of a European invention, and the country was inhabited by indigenous peoples, and now only 1% is considered indigenous. This is ridiculous and unacceptable. Maybe I took the word, maybe I went some other places, but in Canada, it caught my attention that uh, the Métis, which are these um, indigenous blood population that are white, in, in, in some cases they are recognized as native peoples and they have collective rights. So why don't we have the same in Mexico? And why not in Mexico? Because we have similar process. Uh, here in, uh, we were speaking about Tomé, and the and the erased identity and this is a, a status of vulnerability vulnerability and we should see how uh, where we can uh, um, walk to ameliorate this status of vulnerability towards uh, the industries that are called by neighbors uh, in Jojutla these by neighbors uh, are among us because they are the ones renting lands uh maybe because they need it but they are renting them to the sugarcane industries that is the bigger polluter of the space so we are in a competing situation we do not trust others so it's it's very deep how this this uh, mixture uh between races have uh, set up the the context uh this historical context uh in Jujutla and in other villages in the country and of course other places Sorry. Thank you, Alaire. I think this is one of the most important effects, and uh, that are that are still there of this uh, epistemological colonialism that uh, Franz Fanon signaled as one of the fundamental pillars of the um, um, colonial modernity. So this is of course cross-cutting along the, the the whole continent i think it is very interesting and a little bit following your question i think it is very brave and interesting of course i think it is necessary to uh do an introspection um as for example the the therapist that goes through the therapist that goes through um uh it's on it's on therapy let's say we need to go through a decolonizing process ourselves. We need to decide to decolonize ourselves or, or not. I think it's very necessary um, to, to do this prospective work when we, we need to, to begin uh, a project uh, on these terms to give it a more internal uh, energy, let's say, for the project. 
that uh, well is very different uh, sometimes um, I don't know somebody can can want want to speak if there's any opinion uh, here we have yes Hola, gracias. Eh, Alaide, eh, quería preguntarte, eh, hablaste que la lengua eventualmente está muerta. Alaide, I wanted to ask you because you said that there was a dead language. And if you know that there is a new space of revitalization. Also, I wanted to ask you about your personal experience with this through your body. You have two daughters. Are they part of all of these processes? Are they involved somehow? Okay, regarding the language, in my context, my community context, the language disappeared completely. And in that situation, in the registry I did, it disappeared in half a century. My grandmother Fausta spoke the language and she died in 1994, but 101 or 102 years old, she was very old. And when she gives birth, to her first son, she was 30 something. And that event happens when there is this imposition of language, Spanish language in the educational system. So many of my classmates will tell me that it, it, to their parents happened that the teachers would hit them when they talked in their indigenous languages. So they were punished when they said words in their own language. So this goes with what my grandmother thought. So she didn't uh, teach this language to her, to her children because it was a type of protection, so it didn't happen to them. So I have two daughters and they were always with me when I was doing my research. They would travel with me, they would learn with me. I would say that they are daughters of this process with Konami the National Coordination of Indigenous Women. In some of the pictures that I showed there, they were there. And it implies a lot of resistance from the family, from your significant other. They're um, privileged in relation or indifference with my colleagues from Konami because nobody would take care of their children. So I have the support of my family, my mom, my dad, my companion, the father of my daughters. They all were very present and also the support of the community. In Cucutla, if you're speaking on the microphone, somebody's taking care of your children and that also makes these experiences possible and the passion and what you do because the research with Gonadi lasts for seven years. My PhD, I got it in 2013 or 2014 and it's been a while. And if I would have been so involved in it, so passionate about it, I don't know if I could have done it. There were many things that I felt like I had to solve while I was working on this. Thank you. There are many philosophers that talk about this 
kind of thoughts. Maybe we also need to do this kind of research. Talking about thinking, Eddie, I would like to ask you about the ontological twist and the re ontological relations. So it's a twist that it's it happens in the area of the sciences. We have Foucault in 1960s. You work with Haraway as well from the 1970s. She well, was still works on this, but she talks about this big epistemological twist in order to dismantle the modern races and heteropatriarchal discourse in sciences. So if we understand that modern sciences, understanding modernity from, um, from the 15th century, if we understand or that the science is maintaining this coloniality, this process that happened in Europe before. So in Europe, this concept of common lands existed in Europe, but it's, there were also some violences when modernity from Renaissance onwards started. And if we think of modern sciences and these colonial practices in nature as an object of struggle. So do you think that modern science is a violent mechanism, an anti-human mechanism? Okay, thank you for the questions. First of all, regarding Anna Haraway. Anna Haraway, yes, it's one of the main philosophical foundations in my work. But there's a translation of an Argentinian translator. And so that's the literature I directly use also to consider some aspects, interdisciplinary aspects. That is, she as a biologist and also as a philosopher. So how can we put together these two disciplines in different issues? And the topic that I analyze that is interspecies relations, that which is a topic that she also analyzes. There are some very strong chapters. She speaks about chemicals and the effect of chemicals in women. That's a very, very strong chapter. And regarding their relation into species, instead of using the concept Anthropocene, although she describes some concepts and issues, to understand Anthropocene, that's also a very Western way of seeing this when she uses the Anthropocene. That's an aspect that she proposes in that concept to denounce the way in which human and non human beings relate to each other, you know, ecosystems, animals, etc. Regarding this modern science and modernity, one of the colonial factors of the knowledge, an Ecuadorian author talks about three aspects. We have rationalism, modernism coming from modernity, and coloniality or colonialism of the power of the knowledge and the being. 
Eh, and si... how from other categories we are said that our knowledge that is different from the traditional ecological knowledges, the knowledge of traditions, uh, indigenous. There is a lot of diversity within the diversity. Some Sometimes diversity is stated as something homogeneous, but it's not like that. We have a lot of nations, we have a lot of groups. So regarding the legal aspect that we were discussing in the morning, we, we don't just have to take the state law and the state of X and Y communities, even though they do not use these same terms. So it's not just one community taken into account, account, but all of them. Modern science has a lot of bases that come from different methodologies uh, that come from subject and object from my perspective, not just any human being, but a specific human being that meets the requirements to be a subject and all the others are objects. So they take a specific relationship with knowledge. This is something ontological, this is essentialist, subject here and subsin another person an ecosystem other beings non-human beings so we see them as objects and it's used with economical interests that maybe our colleague here can depend on that and we can use science and law for economic interests that seem to be bigger and that represent all of these imperialisms. So science, what we could say critically is that science has had a discourse where it said that we must be objective and neutral, but what we know as science is not neutral, it's not objective. Uh, there are some political issues involved, economical issues, gender issues, different issues that one way or another are visible. So the main problem is trying to see this as something neutral, depending on if we use it for good or for bad. But it goes beyond that. So that's the first thing that the Western traditional science should recognize, saying the truth and having that intellectual sincerity. A lot of scientists have had their own ways of recognizing this. So here we have this concept of situated. So this is what I do. This is how I'm going to do science. I come from this background and I'm going to do the best I can, but I'm telling you, this is my background. My intention is not to be neutral and objective. So some other knowledges are not called knowledges. There are many things. So one thing is saying art and another thing is saying handcrafts or saying science and saying knowledge. So we have different names for things, and that's also a topic. Thank you. This uh, has to do as well with what, with what we were mentioning yesterday, of, uh, things are named by this uh, power of, of uh, the speaker, this uh, privileged power that can be violent as well. Um, I wanted to complement as well um, the, the, the thing you mentioned that uh, maybe can lead to a full seminar. 
Um, but I think um, one of the arguments that try to um, take apart this uh, thinking is is the the trans thinking, uh, this uh, queer movement uh, from biology, for example, uh, and from philosophy as well. I think they're doing a really great job. I'm thinking about a biologist that is Colombian as well. Um, maybe someone wants to speak as well from from the public. Yes, it's it's a little bit more of a question to Rodrigo uh, about property and also for the rest. This uh, topic on property is clearly as a process very well linked uh, from what you showed um, of the of the documentaries that are uh, Colombian um, around a specific villages and communities that have lost their land and other type of uh, accesses. I wanted to ask of the possibility of uh, seeing this relation uh, of, of uh, property from Marxism and to amplify it to other concepts uh, such as uh, the others uh, are property uh, animals, women, indigenous people, uh, plants. Uh, we are property in this uh, science uh, viewpoint that you were uh, speaking about before. So I wanted to comment on this, on how we can uh, break this uh, property vision beyond Marxism and to start seeing it, uh, to, to start opening the discussion into other places. Yes, um, so when we speak about uh, a theoretical structure, we are speaking about a specific um, knowledge community. And I think Um, why um, did I did I about Marxism? Um, is because this dialectic structure and how we contrast uh, different images. But um, when it comes to seeing property from cinema, for example, during the the seventies in Mexico. Um, we have a series of documentaries uh, from women that discuss uh, several topics uh, that we can we can uh, interrelate, uh, for example, urbanism and prostitution after the, the earthquake um, that happened in Ciudad de Mexico. We also have uh, the frozen revolution or revolución congelada that speaks uh, about the, the modernizing process of the Mexican Revolution is, uh, is expagnated uh, and there's a debt with the, with the farmers and the rural people. And um, so how can we think about several categories uh, within the cinema? I think uh, it depends on the on the uh, cinematic current, on the cinem cinematic uh, flow. I'm, I'm reflecting on this because um, apart from studying uh, this, I'm studying cinema in Santiago and that they have been working with a feminist cinema. And uh, the body, of course, is uh, fundamental within that cinema. Uh, when it has when it has to do with uh, the the creation of a um, cinematic narrative here in Chile, we have uh, several uh, interesting documentaries to analyze. 
one uh, is about the, the last people that uh, live in southern Chile that speak the Selknam language. And so the language stays there uh, through the movie and that keeps existing through the movie. We have another documentary that I don't remember the director, but it's on, on, on the island here in, in Chile that reconstructs the, the history uh, of uh, Easter Island through uh, different uh, fragments of interviews. So I feel like Marxism is a theory that explains uh, certain things, but it's very uh, more interesting when we interrelate it with uh, some other theories. For example, uh, we have uh, George Lucas, uh, who's a very important cinema because he studies um, the relation between the, the creator and reality for uh, documentary cinema is one of the pillars that we're taking into account. So um, I think it's very interesting uh, from a theoretical work. Uh, I think this is a, an amazing work when um, the director establishes a story through his body uh, uh, with an introspective uh, project and I think it's very powerful to 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 think this transformation in this way. Um, how how strong are the images that that we create? Because you can put uh, one image next to the other, but that doesn't need uh, that doesn't mean that these images uh, carry a feeling. So we really need to think. Uh, how uh, a narrative is structured. And therefore, I think uh, dialectics is very interesting to be worked from images. Um, if you want to, to work about Marxism or uh, uh, other categories. I wanted to just to add uh, something uh, regarding the, the reflections. I think that the, the problem um, that comes from the nature dominion is very linked to the uh, con the, the concept of, of notion and instrumental, instrumental notion that says that domination of nature somehow uh, implies the domination of human at the end. This is a relation that, that comes and go. And uh, I have always wondered how these different ways of thinking go to critics. So I feel that's, that this uh, complexity is not or concepts um, have not reached um, the general public, the population. And I think uh, this is a result of different uh, factors, but these uh, concepts permeate or not um, within within the society. And we, they, they, we really need to study um, to, for example, explain what happened when we um, developed a, a new constitution that was a very new modern and uh, and at the end it was it was refused so of course uh cinema is it's a very strong uh tool to portray this thank you rodrigo yes go ahead Sí, es que quería como preguntarles, claro, o sea, eh, por la posibilidad de, col de decolonizar la propiedad, de decolonizar el Estado. I wanted to also ask you about the possibility of decolonizing property from the state. We thought that having a property was key, that getting to the state was key, but all of this also restricts us. 
So how can we create these changes? Anyone else wants to say something? Yes. Okay. What I want to say is more like a comment from all of these period experiences. I would say that we are always involved in a situation. In the first experience, having properties also a form of right that is imposed from citizenship. And it seems that the institutions that that mainly did this constantly say to us or they are constant constantly telling us that we must give give what then we have different mechanisms and we assume behaviors in the space to get these rights and being included in this bigger state, of this bigger idea of state. What I think it's curious is that the discourse of these institutions that we ask rights for, but we don't ask, we also claim them, the forms of state are not national right now, they are cursed national. The body is not only there for state violence, also structuralist violence. So it's very curious because finding ourselves there in order to find a common struggle, it's further. And it seems that the ways of recognizing are interesting and valid, but they can also be in this play or this game of recognizing ourselves and our own value. So I feel like we are now trying to find a common utopia, utopia that help us to find or integrate these diversities and from the aesthetical proposal plays a result. And that would be it for my side. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your presentations. Thank you very much for the comment. So just one minute this time for real, just one minute for real. If not, the coffee break will be shorter. So one minute, you wanted to say something to answer the first question. Yes, I was the one who talked more. Am I allowed to keep talking? Yes. Okay, thank you. In this proposal of reinvention, I liked a lot the end of Rodrigo's exposition and this invitation to rethink property and how do we want to relate to property as human subjects and members of a something social that is bigger, that is macro, social, natural, whatever you want to call it, but it's life, it's existence. And I also link this to finding how from academia we can help build bridges between movements and social changes, helping this translation and be in this role of speaker between these different struggles. It's painful sometimes we think of concepts and we go to the field and there they use other words. And something like that happened to me, Rodrigo, with what you say about rethinking property further from what Marx said from the capitalist fetishist property. I remember I was in an exposition this year, early this year happened. It was a seminar 
about women participation in agrarian spaces in Mexico. And I remember I was speaking about natural resources in the Oaxaca context. And one of the leaders of the defense of the water, and her name is Carmelina. She died of cancer this year, unfortunately. And she interrupted me because I said, recursos naturales, national resources. And she said, wait, we don't talk about natural resources here. I would like that we change these ways of rela relation. And she was a very important leader in Atlantic for the water recourses. So here we say that they are communal richness. They are richness that do not belong to anyone. And that changes the whole perspective to see property are something different, the right to life, it is bigger. So how can we imagine and make our position differently? One minute just to close. Un minuto. Eh, yo creo que el, para concluir lo que, estaba, lo que estamos discutiendo, I a mí me think parece... that to close what we are currently discussing, I think it is important to think the image of political and aesthetic. There is a thinker that is very interesting. He has a book called Sublevaciones, Sublevation. Um, he thinks about these different images of cinema and photography and how they think about the look. So there is an idea, an interesting idea. It's that image is comes before the word and from those images we create concepts if we think of it that way cinema or film can be a very efficient and important tool to create new concepts new ways of thinking new ways of feeling let's say and it's a tool that nowadays is very accessible to anyone i would say that the dream of the Dada is, is more present than ever. Any person with a phone that knows a bit about pictures or tries to know more about this, and the assembly is present in us. So these are the first forms of what is visual, and we have to think about these discursive ways and how they help to reinforce the different political projects that exist. In the first place, the concept of territory is something that unites us, whether it, we come from architecture, from public spaces, from biology, sciences, the concept of territory makes us come together to our different activities. Territories as well need to be bigger. This concept needs to be expanded. If we think about the Amazon, this has been questioned through local places. So the territory takes this in a very vast way in Colombia, in the north, west, all the cardinal points, they say that they also need to be recognized in a relation with the Amazon and how what happens in the Amazon affects their health and their life. And last but not least, a concept about being intersectional, cross-cutting, so this concept of climate justice and climate change, which is an elegant way of calling a lot of crisis. And we have this climate justice 
that also brings together all the territories. It relates to urban and the rural, what is there and what is here. It relates everything. It comes everything together because we all live in the same planet that it's irreplaceable planet Earth. And I would add a different, an different term that is Earth. And this European ethnocentric modern thought appropriated this concept, Earth, land. So there's lands were turned into landscape. It's such a beautiful word, tierra in Spanish, earth, land in English. So I would keep this concept as well. Okay, so thank you very much. I will be back at 5, 5.05 to watch documentaries. Thank you very much.